Christmas season forces us to speak on Christmas, which we will do this Sunday. So today, let's continue on our armor. Now, <clears throat> why we are speaking on the armor? Simply because the Lord told us to look at the armor. Remember? That's it. There's two ways of handling the armor, either complicated study or study it and use it. Some people know a lot of technical knowledge about a gun. They know the specs, they know the millimeter, they know the mechanical words for every part. Like they have memorized it, they've got a lot of uh, desire for mechanical understanding of the way a gun works. I know how to strip a rifle because that's part of my military training. They got a strip, I think my best timing was 25 seconds or something, and then put it back. Um, you'll get used to it, right? But some people have technical knowledge. Some people don't have knowledge about a gun. They point and shoot. That's all they have to work. <laughs> they know how to load, and they know how to point, and they know how to squeeze. Finish. Basic things. You bring it to the gunsmith, that guy will know technical knowledge. You tell him upgrade, you'll just say, you know, it must do like this. He will say, what is the type of spring you must use, what is the upgrade. After doing all that, yeah, yeah, true, yes, that's the one. You bring it home, point and shoot. The same way, we can know about the weapons of our warfare in a very technical knowledge. Greek and Hebrew, almost everything, dissecting, I think when you're reading a book, important, yes. But when you're coming into a reflective understanding of scriptures, the practicality of it, to use it so that it works for you is more important. Amen? The more you use it, the more it becomes easier. You don't have to really think, oh, I must use this now. Oh, remember, yeah, the shield is given to me. Yeah, I've given this. It will become just natural in the end of the subject. We're going to talk about it. So I have to battle into my mind every time I'm preparing this subject. I've thought this before on technicalities, how the Greek word appears here. And but then when I'm approaching here in our church now, to keep it easy, enjoy the scriptures and enjoy, enjoy the richness of God's word. Amen? Now, keep in mind, guys, we are not having Bible study to enjoy Bible study. We are studying because we are being clothed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand the difference? Because if it's just another Bible study, I think we can stay at home. But if we are coming to be equipped in the Spirit... Because the Lord is equipping us for a reason. Then we should do it. Okay? And I remember going for, when I was in the basic military training, that week is what we call the grenade. Do you say a grenade? Kaboom. Grenade. 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 Okay, it's the same. You like to pull things further, that's all. Grenade. By the time you grenade, it kaboom. <laughs> so, we went for a jungle training. And we have seven hours training, classroom th training of what a grenade does. Seven hours. And then you'll be wondering, just to throw, you need to know this technical knowledge. Why? Because there are people who will pull the pin and they will not let it go. And they will, instead of throwing, it slips out and kaboom. There are many officers who have lost their arms, died, all because of nervous participants. And so during that three to four days of sessions and throwing dummy grenades, they will already know 
who can throw and who cannot. Who's got sweaty palms and who's got anxiety issues. Because if you do something wrong, your neighbor's life is in your hands. In the earthly, the military language is so strong and the training is so tedious. But you know, more than a visible enemy, we are fighting against an invisible enemy. Must we not train ourselves more? For those who came to Tuesday and those who did not, Tuesday morning prayer, which was yesterday morning, Two angels came and stood beside me, which I'm going to get this prophecy transcribed and after Christmas we'll talk about it. Two angels of destruction. And I've not seen angels who were dressed up like that in sackcloth, dusty, robustic looking, very strong men looking very manly and not so angelic, but carrying sackcloth because it, they bring destruction and there's so much of sadness that is about to happen. And there are things that the Lord showed me about the church readiness to get involved when bad things happen. Is the church ready to get involved in, when some, let's say for example, when building drops or shakes and get destroyed? Are we ready to carry the bricks and do we have things to help you know you get what i'm saying so the lord spoke to me all during this time of prayer the next year we want to engage even more into social involvement readiness and preparation not just about me my family my church but it's about our city our our town are you with me you see until the eye dies nothing of the spirit will be birthed forth in our lives. And I pray that we will become trustworthy of what God has entrusted into our lives. Amen? Amen. And so these are the things that sometimes takes my, the world mood away. You know, we're talking about Christmas, I want to relax and something will happen, then I'll be more uptight again, thinking and reflecting on what God is showing to me. And then he showed me about next year some stuff that is going to happen which I'm waiting for the seven days fasting prayer, then we'll talk about it. Not that I don't wish to say, but everything God tells us, there must be a time to ponder and reflect. How to say it in the right way. So this evening, let's continue. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. We are, tonight we will very quickly look at the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 6, 14, Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. In the same, uh, same uh, verse, but in the Amplified Bible, Stand therefore, hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth, around your loins and having put on the breastplate of of what? Look at what righteousness now means in the Greek. He has, it has to do with not just a God component of our life, but with a natural component of who we are or who we should be in this world of moral rectitude and right standing with God. Are you with me? So that now shocks us further. Because it is easy to say, God, forgive me. Fill me with your righteousness. You have done it for free. You have done on the cross. So I'm now the righteousness of Christ. I'm filled with God's righteousness. But when it comes to integrity, you can't write that off. God holds you responsible. You can't say, Lord, I am an integrity person through you and in you, but outside you I am who I am. You can't, you can't write that off because the righteousness of Christ is helping us to become a person of integrity 
that affects the breastplate of righteousness on us. You get what I'm saying? So if you really think about it, not every weapon is just spiritual in a sense. There are part of us to hold it. There must be a certain character to hold it. The breastplate, as the, as the Roman uh, uh, understanding of this uh, weapon, it is a basically an armored plate that is on. Now, of course, you have the bulletproof proof, uh, vest. You can do that. But those days they have to, they can't avoid bigger damage. They can avoid some parts of the damage. But keep in mind, every time you brace it, you bump it, you, there is an impact. The body will be painful, but it will not cut off. That's what the theory and the understanding is. Okay? But the moment you know you are wearing a breastplate of righteousness or breastplate of, in a time of warfare, you will not be afraid. You will dare to fight. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you, are, you, are you following? I know it's very difficult to imagine unless you buy some kind of a, you know, even the swimming vest, uh, the floating device. The moment the device is on you, you will dare to jump on the water because you know it's going to float. You see, some courage comes because there is a device to protect you. I used to watch uh, before. No, uh, now I don't have time because my... My nephew, my sister's son, is a crazy MotoGP follower. So, I, I, you know, we stayed for, for a while with him. It's, it's the MotoGP means it's a Moto Formula One type of racing for motorcycles. And so when he, that race is about two and a half hours, he'll force me to sit and say, Uncle, watch with me. So it's about 22 rounds. I'll watch the first round and I'll come back for the 22nd round. In between, you do whatever because I'm busy. I, I can't be seeing the guys running up and down all the time. Each rider's suit that they are wearing is about five to seven or ten thousand dollars made of leather. And that is why sometimes you see the motorcycles will drop, they'll slide, and they will stand up, take the bike, and walk. Nothing happens. There is a automatic emergency device that will pump the air oxygen and they have a flotation device inside that will hold the backbones all from breaking so they can roll and nothing happens to them. And the moment you know that you are wearing such a device, you are not afraid to speed, turn, and you know if you drop, you will stand up. So when you are protected, you will dare to fight. When you know you are protected, you'll have the courage to face your enemy. Are you with me? And so the issue is when I, why people don't dare to fight the enemy? Because they are not, uh, they do not know enough of, am I protected? Will God be with me? And so one of the things that God has given to us is all the spiritual armor and the important, the breastplate of righteousness. And that's what we are discovering. Now remember, the first thing to remember, our character is our defense because the breastplate of integrity, remember? So our character becomes the first aspect of defense. Let me build that base with you where the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12, I remember speaking to you before about this a little bit I will touch again a little bit. Another time we will really study it a lot more. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. That's good. Yeah, ESV, that's right. For our boast is this. The testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. The testimony of our conscience. Now, when you say your testimony, everybody else know, 
but the testimony of our conscience only you will know before God. Because no one can see your conscience. How you are framing up the line and sentences, it is between you and God. Are you with me? But now Paul is saying the first defense in our life is to have a testimony concerning your conscience. If you are knocked out in this, you are done. And that is why the enemy wins the warfare. He said he be, that we behaved in the world. You see, the way we behave in the world affects our testimony. It affects our conscience standing before God. You cannot write off, but I am righteousness in Christ, and then I do this. The integrity factor is yours. Are you with me? When I did a study on the grace of God and the favor of God, what does this two mean? Because though in the Hebrew it sounds similar, like people say, you know, the lower end of preaching is, or the simple preaching, the word grace is in the New Testament, the word favor is the, of the Old Testament. So as I spent months studying and dissecting the Hebrew word and the Greek word and to see how it functions throughout the Bible. And I preached years ago an understanding of that. Grace is given as a free gift. But favor is not a free gift. You have to earn it with God. Grace is given because of what Jesus had done. Favor comes because of what you do for Christ. Grace is given whether you do it or not. The grace is still floating for you. Favor only comes when you obey God's word. Are you with me? You cannot put everything on the soup bowl of free. And that is why many things we are not able to attain. This whole day has been a day of reflection. A lot of things I was reflecting away. I, I, I was amazed that I had this time to reflect. So I had this time of reflection. which I will sh share with you the scripture, what was the result of that. Paul is saying now, the way I behave in the world, whether do I have simplicity and godly sincerity. You know what is simplicity and godly sincerity? That means I don't cover up my sins with complicated thing. you know. You come up with all the magical ways of covering up your sin when your sincerity must be so simple and godly. You know, one thing about lies is this. You must remember what was the last lie you said. And if you are telling a story of lies, you've got to remember every turn and every point, what was the last thing you said. So if the person is asking you again, you must remember the lies. But truth, you don't have to remember. You say it as it is. You don't have to fabricate and you don't have to think about it. You don't have to cover anything. You can say about 55 times and throughout the next 25 years, there is only one version of the truth. Somebody say amen. amen. Sometimes for people, not everybody start their life that way. In some family setting and upbringings, they have to lie their way to survive. If they tell the truth, they'll die. There is no way they can live life by telling the truth, so they have to fabricate stories to earn their way out of a lifestyle of bondage. But you see what happens when you meet Jesus. Your environment changes. The people around you changes. And so now God wants you to transform into a life of bondage to a life of truth, a life of lie to a life of truth. So that will take some time of practicing the truth because Jesus has come in and the truth of God is setting you free. Amen. And then at that point, if you're telling the truth, you are ready to face the consequences. Are you with me? 
And but God is saying, Paul is saying here, you see, our conscience in who you are is important. He says, not by earthly wisdom. Now, what's wrong with earthly wisdom? You think about it for a minute. What is wrong with earthly wisdom? Nothing is wrong. But there, are, but there comes a time where earthly wisdom is not compared to godly wisdom. Amen. And so there will come a time when earthly wisdom has to be written over by godly integrity. You cannot say what's wrong with earthly wisdom. Paul overwrites it with the testimony of my conscience, godly and sincere sin sincerity, not by earthly wisdom. Why? Because often when we say earthly wisdom, there is a level of corruption into it. You see? And there are some things that you make a stand for God, you draw only from what God said, not what earthly wisdom is telling you anymore. Because not every one of us can dissect all the time to throw the bones and take the flesh of earthly wisdom. You know, like sometimes eating certain type of fishes, type of fish, there are 2,000 bones in one small fish. <laughs> Just throw the thing away or put it into a blender, drink it like a juice. <laughs> because it's such a waste of time, you know. You need to be so careful that you don't swallow up and, and then something got stuck there. It's just that dangerous. But there are people who eat. I, I've seen. They got to... Okay, I don't wish to even explain. Some people need to be born like cats, but they are born as humans. And so they enjoy this kind of fishes all the time. <laughs> I, 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 I don't have time. My mind is always away when I'm eating. Okay? Praise God. But you see, the way, the same thing uh, when it comes to earthly wisdom, there are some things which are so corrupted, by the time you use that earthly wisdom, you've got to take all the corruption away, rather walk with God. You see? Now, you need to work out what those things are. And then Paul is saying, it is by the grace of God. So when we walk in the testimony of our conscience. The grace of God is active. The power of God's word becomes stronger when our conscience is clean before the Lord. That is why the moment your conscience is troubled, you need to confess very quick. The moment your conscience is troubled, you need to walk right with God again. The moment you are consciously wrong, you need to make right. Sometimes when when husbands and wives are talking, you're trying to win over the conversation, the Holy Spirit will point it. Ah, yeah. You just make a U-turn at that story. I know you're not telling the truth. Make right. Because your conscience is being pricked now. And that is why the Holy Spirit is so sensitive. The Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve Him. He's a very sensitive, gentle person. The moment you are grieved, He's grieved, the anointing stops. The sensation of His presence leaves. Are you with me? Have you been there in a party? In a house party or wedding? You can find whether the husband and wife are happy or not. Because they will be together, but they are not together. They are together, but they are just ignoring each other. The silent effect is so visible that anybody who looks at them, they know something is going on. Isn't it? Hello? <laughs> Sorry, I think I'm putting some fish bone somewhere. <laughs> hey, husband and wife, you did not get married to be silent. If you want to be silent, become a monk in a monastery. If you have got married, it is to fellowship with one another. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just remember the basic things. You made a vow to talk. That is why men got 15,000, women are blessed with 25,000 words. <laughs> the testimony of our conscience is number one. Number two, you'll be surprised how the breastplate works. Number two, the natural walk in, uh, on earth 
with the fear of the Lord. Natural walk. I shared this scripture with you before in Psalms chapter 15. Now why am I tackling this way? Because every time we talk about breastplate of righteousness, people will say, but Christ in you. Yes, you're right. But when the conscience is not right with God, no matter what breastplate you put on, it will not stick on you. It will lift you. And then now you've got to diagnose further, what is wrong with that individual now? Why is that no matter what I pray, it's not, glowing, it's not going through. The deliverance is not sticking. The prayer is not sticking. The anointing is just flowing out of them. That is an issue. And Psalms 15 gives us the answer. Verse 1, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Or who shall dwell in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill, which is where the presence of God? And verse 2 says, He who walks blamelessly, and does what is right, and speaks the truth in his heart. Now, this has got nothing to do with spiritual qualities. But it's got everything to do with God. Are you with me? God is so, if I politely can use, He is so bothered with how you are walking on earth. And that affects your standing with God. Are you with me? He said you've got to be blameless. You've got to do what is right. Speaks truth in his heart. Now, many people will give a cheeky statement. Well, that's not in the Bible. There is an open clause, kind of an open statement in the Bible, doing what is right, even though it is not in the Bible. That means it is the principle of conscience, doing what is right. You cannot run away. Well, it's not in the Bible for me to follow. Doing what is right. It's an open clause of discipleship. Amen? Amen. So that the conscience is not affected. Then number three, it says, speaks through, uh, walk blamelessly, do what is right. Number three, speaks truth in his heart, not the mouth. Because the truth can be in your heart and the mouth is lying. So now God is looking, your heart speaks first. And there must be truth in that heart. Are you with me? And look at number three. At number four, sorry. Verse three. Does not slander with his tongue. And then it says, does no evil to his neighbor. He does not take a reproach against a friend. In whose eyes a vile person is despised. But who honors those who fear the Lord. You know what happens in this world? When you have gossiping friends, all these first few points are your coffee time friends. And if you talk the truth, you've got nothing to talk to some of your friends. Because they are not interested in the truth. They are interested in gossip time. Who to break down later. Who to talk about. Whose past sins to pull forward. Are you with me? If you follow this whole thing, you really may not have enough coffee time to talk with anybody much. You'll be a little bit more of a boring person. That person is righteous, don't get to her, don't get to him. You won't be able to gossip. But if you want to have gossip, you will know who to call. You know, you know what happened that day? <laughs> the story will start. <laughs> Would you want to be known? Because the Bible 100% says you'll be rejected by God. You see? Do you understand what I'm saying? How serious is this? Who would you think in the end of the day is going to accept you? Our friends? No, God. And that is the only fear that must take you over. And he says that those who honor those who fear the Lord. Do you honor those who fear God? Who swears to his own hurt and does not change. You give a word of honor, fulfill it. God looks at that. Now, I'm telling you scriptures that I saw when I was 15 years old. 
And I made a vow to follow as much as I could. Because I saw in verse 5, he does not put out his money as interest that I don't have to worry, don't have money to give interest anyway. So, but does not take a bribe against the innocent. We don't have to worry about that. So he who does these things shall never be moved. I said, God, help me not to be moved. Not to be shaken. And the Bible says, if you do all these things, when you come and stand before me, when you put on your breastplate of righteousness, it will hold. If you behave wrongly, when you come and stand before me and pretend all the spiritual armor gig that you will do, nothing will hold in my presence. You will be almost be looking like a clown in spiritual warfare than an actual soldier. Are you with me? You see, when we were in Gettysburg um, this year, the, the, it was also the Independence Day. So in Gettysburg is where the, some of the war took place. And so they have the dress up of the different war and they will recite and all of that. So the afternoon, the evening was my session. And afternoon I, have a quick, I had a quick walk, walking around and all of that. See everybody dress up to be pretending to be somebody else. And during the evening service, I saw a vision. I said, the church has a lot of pretenders and dressed up people. But they are not actual soldiers who can fight. They got weapons that cannot fire. They are good in telling history, but they are not themselves ready to fight. You get what I'm saying? Are we like that, my brothers? The Bible is not a book of admiration. It is a book of transformation. It is not a history book to be memorized. It's a book that is being written to be followed. If not, we will go on to the wrong side and we will not remember why God gave us the word. And the third thing that I want to remind you, which we all know, is the righteousness in Christ. The first is about the integrity. Number two is our natural walk. The first is conscience. Number two, natural walk. And number three, who, you are, who are you in Christ? And this is the one which the Lord spoke to me when I said I was reflecting. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen? Now that's fantastic. I love this scripture. And I lift this scripture and I take upon the scripture. Why when you are a beginning newborn Christian, your baggage which you bring and you have to have enough confidence to work with God and you have to keep reminding this scripture to yourself. See, I'm a new creation. All things have passed away. I'm God's righteousness and so on because your past is so alive in your mind. And then when you're all transformed, you think you're a holy saint, God reminds us that your righteousness on your own is like filthy rags. You got to remember it is the blood that has been accepted because of your righteousness. Amen? And so now the Bible tells us, I am become the righteousness of Christ. But you see, now there is your challenge. You have become the righteousness of Christ, but Ephesians 4.24 says, Put on the new self because God is holding us responsible for putting on what God has given to us. If not forever, we will be challenged, you see. And that is what I want to remind ourselves. Sometimes when I look at our church and some, sometimes when I, we are working with the youth, we are working with the people. Oh, no matter what you do, they don't pray. No matter what you say, they don't follow. But there will come a day we will stand before the king. If you are alive, you will have time to repent. You are dead, you are too bad, it's done. Do you remember the parable? Where this man was taken up and he died. He cried and said, God, if you will just make me to go back, Abraham's bosom. 
If you will just help me just one time, send your servants, uh, uh, prophets, to my brothers and warn them. Please, I'm in hell. Now I know everything you said is truth. I should have been passionate. I should have remembered who God is. I should have pressed on to God. Do you know how many reasons people have not to be passionate with God? The devil has created enough storylines that people are hiding between, oh, his personality is like that. Wow. You want to go to hell? You want your personality to drag you down to hell? Huh? What about that? We can't help it. He's born with it. Nobody is born with anything. Everybody is born to become a disciple of Christ. Jesus has... Jesus was born that you and I will be set free. Amen? Amen. Sometimes, even as parents, even as loved ones, we forgot which camp are you standing on. You forgot that you've got to stand on the camp of God, and God's word is the truth. Every man is a liar. You see? Because you've got to extract a corrupted wisdom. You've got to find where is the truth in that corrupted wisdom. That is why Paul is now saying, discard that earthly wisdom. Choose the grace of God. Choose the purposes of God. Choose God's word. Amen. Amen. You see, that's the principle. And, and so God is reminding us now, I've got the righteousness, uh, righteousness of Christ, but I have to put on the righteousness of Christ. The life we live either fortifies us against Satan's attacks or makes it easier for him to defeat us. What is the type of life I'm living? Now, Romans 8, 1 is a reflection point where the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And this is the last part of the point that I'm going to say. Where miracles do happen, look at that. It's 804 and I'm saying that's the last point. Can you believe that? Oh, man. Romans 8 verse 1, therefore there is now no, come on, it is so easy, everybody knows it by heart. There is therefore now no condemnation who is in Christ Jesus. Amen? It's a condemnation of self is a result of a life that is living worldly, in the flesh, or even ungodly. So most of the time we are helping people not to be condemned instead of helping people to be in Christ. We have counseling programs. Oh, he's feeling guilty. Oh, he comes from a person now. Oh, he comes from a family uh, of people who condemn him before. He's been put down so much. The issue is not about his environment. The issue, he has chosen an ungodly life. Because there is therefore no condemnation to him who is in Christ Jesus. If you are not in Christ Jesus, all the amount of counseling will not work. And some people like the condemnation because there is funding for them, free funding, free money. Everybody loves you, everybody gives you money, everybody feels sorry for you, everybody surrounds you, everybody wants to kiss you, hug you, bring you out for coffee because you're feeling so down, and that drags for an entire year. <laughs> so when they are uptight with this church, okay, go to next church. The whole thing will start again. So they take a ride with condemnation, but the thing is you don't know when this ride will stop, when that condemnation will lead you to hell. And so that is the reason why sometimes we can't get our folks to get out of the world because there is an ungodly lifestyle or worldly lifestyle or a lifestyle of sin that is bringing that condemnation into them. We got to deal with it straight on. If not, you are no worthy to fight the enemy. You see? The Bible says we are not We are not ignorant of the devil's devices. I, I wish we could all say the same line all the time. But the truth is, we are ignorant many times. 
You see, the devil don't have to create new warfare planes to uh, hit us down. He uses the same temptation that has always been part of our personality card because one day we will lose it. <laughs> but we don't know which is that day, you see. Like Samson, every time he told a lie, he will bounce back, he will laugh. He was laughing at Delilah and he will keep telling the lie. Why didn't he know, don't tell the lie, tell the truth. Not to the wrong person, don't tell the truth. Because you should not be in her arms in the first place. It is not about the arm of a woman. It is not going for the arm of a love. It's not about that. It's about being the wrong woman. I was in uh, Silicon Valley in California. Uh, when I was counseling, and this lady came and she was weeping away in that prophetic line that I was praying for. It was a house fellowship, but many people came and that lasted more than two and a half hours praying for people. And she was weeping and crying and weeping and crying like a little baby, you know. She was 60 something years old. I was so moved by her crying. I said, what, 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 what is this about? She said, I, I, I fall in love with a man. I said, okay. And he cheated me. Uh, okay. But it was over the chat for two years. I, I, I'm still trying to compute. How can you fall in love with a man over the internet and you cry like a baby over a person that you have not seen before? <laughs> and he has already cheated her of $20,000. Aren't you not supposed to wise up the first time he asks you for money? Some people are so wise when it comes to giving money to their own family, they become so dumb when other people outside ask the money and they give it to them. You get what I'm saying? Because love, they know the weakness of love. That's a weak spot. So keep giving love and they will open up. You got to just remind yourself the breastplate of righteousness. Now, anyway, I'm not preaching all this so we will be less love boats in the church. I'm talking about being armored for Jesus Christ. That's what I'm more concerned about. It looks like even when we are resting, the enemy is targeting us all the time. So before he targets us, I want to be the first one zero on him and target him. How's that? I'm not going to wait for him to engage me. I'm already engaging him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christmas is not a time to put down your weapons. Keep your weapons at the side when you're happily having a barbecue. <laughs> uh, sorry, barbecue in this southern means pork all the time. <laughs> you fellas have lied to me. I thought it's beef. <laughs> no one tells the truth in this country, man. Barbecue is supposed to be beef, bro. I don't know how you disguise this whole thing and put pork there and say, is it because it's Porkville Road? Right, okay. <laughs> Sadhu was taken up to heaven. In one of his visitations that he had. And uh, America has 46 presidents, right? I'm going to be in a hot soup for saying this, but it's a public knowledge. He has said it too many times. America's president now is number 46. And uh, he said he only saw four presidents who walk right with God, and they are in heaven praying. That's a scary thing, you know. Uh, talking about 42 guys are out of the game. Whether they are out there doing nothing or God did not admit or they didn't walk right with God or they said all the Christian prayers because it's a Christian nation, they have to say it, but inside their heart they are not converted perhaps. I don't know. Isn't that serious? And God will do something for the state of a nation and the leader who participated in every 
prayer, that prayer, that prayer, this prayer, and God can reject is not through your outward work of your righteousness, but the inner conversion of your heart. If God can do as to a statesman, how much more we will be scrutinized by the fire of the Holy Spirit. You see. The enemy is going to do all that he can to segregate the children of God with a level of confusion. Unless you walk by the Holy Spirit, we will fall. Because his disguise is greater than earthly wisdom that you have accumulated. You see? You, you think about this for a minute. So, uh, Terry is 50, what, this year? 55. Now, he's got 55 years of accumulated wisdom from different people and all of that. So, let's put 60. Five years of advanced wisdom you've got. But there are 10 people, 60 times 10, 600 years put together, is thinking how to deceive you. How you, you've got no chance to win that, man. Sometimes you could barely win a lie which our children tell you. <laughs> One child lie, you can't even stand. You fall. But 600 years put together is trying to knock you out to plan the whole concept of Babylon in this end times. How are you going to live against that if you walk in your earthly wisdom? Therefore, God has given to us a spirit which is so holy. And he said, that holy God is inside you. For that to be effective, the breastplate of righteousness is important. That is why somehow it is called a breastplate of righteousness. You know what it does? It protects your heart. It protects your kidney. It protects your lungs. In fact, the breastplate protects all your vital organs. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. You lose your heart, you lose everything. The breastplate of righteousness is about your integrity. It's about how you walk on earth. It's what you're selected for. And how God will look at you. And when you put on the breastplate of righteousness, the enemy is afraid of a righteous man. Because in him, there is no guile. Can you believe when Nicodemus, uh, Nicodemus came in the night, he came in to ask Jesus a question. Jesus said, I saw you. You have no guile in you. Wow. That attracted this time. Because no one in the Bible came to speak to Jesus in the night. It was always quiet time. It was him and God. But this guy sneaked out and comes in the night. And particularly, he would have come enough time to be noticed and was written. And the thing is, Jesus entertained him because in him there is no guy. Wow. My brothers and sisters, the breastplate of righteousness will bring any guilt to us because we feel we are incomplete without God. You start small, you'll become big one day. But if you keep on going with a path of lies, lack of integrity, or worldliness, you'll become a candidate for Jezebel because he's looking out for false soldiers in the end time too. And that is the hardest part, is to get us into a pathway. People will say, keep lying. Keep lying to get your things done. Because when you tell the truth, nobody will open the door for you. But when you tell the lie, one lie will open the other lie because everybody will believe a lie. That is why our children don't dare to tell the truth. Because when you tell the truth, you don't get it. But when you tell a lie, even being a parent, you'll fall for it. Are you with me? So you see where it starts? At home. The Bible says, bring up a child that it should go. If you will teach our children, you tell the truth, I'll give it to you. Don't tell a lie. 
I may not give to you everything, but I'll give you one at least. Just tell the truth. Teach them and reward them for telling the truth. Help them not to lie. Help them not to lie to the world. Because when they learn that trick, some have made that to become their lifestyle. That is why Christians are number one to be deceived all the time. Because we are so trained in the truth, we are not discerning in lies. And one guy comes out from the prison, he knows how to tell you this and tell you that. Or anybody comes and tells you this, you'll be deceived in the next five minutes. Because that is a master deceiver. You have never learned how to discern that. You're so, I smell the fragrance of Christ in there. Yeah, sure, good to know. Smell some darkness time to time. <laughs> so you will know how to smell the enemy. Amen. One pastor told me years ago, he said, the Bible says ships will come in wolf's clothing. He said, but how to, how to know that's a wolf or that's a sheep? He said, when after they leave the church, just look down at their uh, footprints. Where the footprints, you will know whether it's a wolf or whether it's a sheep. What footprint do you leave behind? In your office? With your friends? In church? In your family? What footprint do you leave behind when people look down? The footprint of Christ and truth and integrity? Where your breastplate is not affected? And that is why I've become a crusader from the day I started preaching. Preach the truth of God's word. Drill it as deep as you can. And I was fascinated of how they do the underground drilling. Whenever you, they do drilling for oil, have you, have you seen those videos? U.S.? One, two, who cares? We get the oil, that's all we care, right? <laughs> But you know what happens when you drill deeper? Because those have uh, uh, the curve. Uh, uh, you see, the technicalities are coming out. Very good. The bit, the drill bit, the giant drill bit. Oh, we'll talk to the oil rig man. Mr. <laughs> Alexis, just there. So you keep drilling. What happens is not just drilling down. The bit is bringing the dirt up. And then when it comes to up, and it just spills it out. And that is why as it keeps on picking up the dirt, you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. You're descending in. Are you with me? And that's what God's Word does. As we go deeper in God, God drills us in. And all the dirts which are hidden and which are lying, and the devil that has made strongholds in the different aspects of our life, as you go deeper in God and allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you, as you dive deeper in God's Word, the hidden stones and whatever not is going to float out. Amen. You know, sometimes when you look back at your own life, you may not like it. That is the depravity of sin. And that is why we look at the grace of God. That he touched me and saved me. We cannot understand that subject. And that is why I want to teach the power of God's word in our church. God's word will create a billion solutions than smart counseling. God's word has the power to set the captives free instead of having 10 different types of outreach programs. I mean, it's good. Don't get me wrong. But the power is more important, not just the activity. The goal is not to have an anointed pastor or a pastoral team or an anointed elders team. That is not the goal. The goal is every man and woman sitting on the pew is anointed by the Holy Spirit. Because if I want to be anointed, then I don't have to teach anybody what I'm hearing from God. Then I'll be on the top of the game. But if everybody is to be touched by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
Then as we hear from God, we teach the people of God. Somebody say, Amen. You see, the breastplate of righteousness will reveal who we are and will clothe us in. Now, I've done enough spiritual warfare, seen enough demons to tell you how they will knock us out by pricking onto your conscience. They will remind you of sin. You will see visions of sin being committed. I remember, I just give you this point and we are going to pray. Oh, sorry. Even last point, it is going the longer last point. <laughs> I was invited to pray for a 16-year-old boy who was demon-possessed by Lucifer. The parents are not uh, um, safe, but they came to hear about me that uh, there's this pastor who pray for deliverance. There are a couple of guys in, in Singapore, my pastor friends, who are anointed with deliverance. I handle certain types. Some other types, I send them to different churches. You go, they will help you. So I went to the hospital. The guy has never read the Bible before, but he could quote scriptures like water. He has never read the Bible before, he could quote every verse in the book of Revelation. So I went in, he looked at me, oh, I know you are coming. He doesn't even know who I am. He doesn't know my name. He said, I know you are coming. He quotes scriptures to me. And then he started telling me about my grandfa grandfather. How, what kind of life he lived, what sin he was committed, what my, the commit, uh, sins of my father, my father and grandfather. Can you believe that? To knock my position of confidence. You see, certain demonic possessions are of a higher level. And the way they will want to knock you out is to strip you of your armor, you see. So I was talking to him, okay, you already told my grandfather, my father, what about me now? He's got nothing to say. That's the point, I'm standing in front of you. Continue. Because now I'm armored in Christ. My grandpa was not. My father was not. No point talking about sinners to a sinner. Talk about the righteous. Let's, let's talk about that. Finish. The deliverance did not really go well. Because it was a hospital, you can't do much. You can't do the Pentecostal or roller coaster prayer. You must be very evangelical. But the point being, your armor will either put you on top or either it will weigh you down. If you carry your armor in the flesh, you will feel the weight of spiritualities. And that is why some people don't enjoy their spirituality. It is such a labor to them. It is such a hard work to them. It's such a drag, you know, if I don't pray, you know, what will happen if I don't pray? I don't know, tell me. They keep a, always give a clock. Do you know what will happen if I don't pray? How do I know what happens to you when you don't pray? You tell me. If I don't pray, I'll still have a good sleep. The Lord will give me good sleep and tell me continue tomorrow. Because you're praying. Have you noticed that some people pray so much, the Lord tell you, please go to sleep? <laughs> some people don't pray at all. They want to fall asleep. The Lord slaps you. Wake up and pray. <laughs> the angels will come and give you a kick. Wake up and pray, I say. <laughs> And if you continue sleeping, he will withdraw sleep from you and you'll be like an owl at two o'clock in the morning. You're not sleeping at all because you don't pray. You think about it for a minute. The armor, the breastplate of righteousness. I pray that God will empower each one of us. Why not talk about demons? Another day we can talk about. We need to know little about them, more about God. Amen. We cannot spend our whole life talking about demons because there are too many categories. There is only one God. Isn't that powerful? <laughs> there is a demon of everything, but there is only one powerful God. You know, one name is enough. Can we all stand up together? Father, we want to thank you. You and I are being made in the righteousness of Christ. Will you take a few moments right now to give thanks, God, I thank you for the righteousness. I thank you for empowering me. I thank you for who the blood of Christ is in my life. I put on the new self. 
Lord, which is created in the righteousness of Christ. I pull down all the falsehood. I pull down all the world out of me. I pull down all the ungodliness out of me. Oh God, that I will put on the breastplate of righteousness. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. When I see myself, I don't see myself. I see who Christ is in me. That when the enemy see me, uh, he will see who Christ is in me. Amen. That he that is in me who is greater than he that is in this world. Amen. So Father, I pray your mercy will equip everybody in the name of Jesus. I praise you and honor you as you told us to be equipped by the spiritual armor. That we will put on the armor of Christ. You are our righteousness. And I thank you for this evening. Father, we pray God's continual blessings will be upon everybody as we come before your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Give the Lord a clap offering. Bless one another. And then have a wonderful holidays for Christmas.